Hi, welcome to the first in our three-part series to discuss cardiomyopathy and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, I'm Kathy Kennett. I'll be moderating this presentation. We're pleased to be joined by Dr. Con Hoare, who is Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Con is a pediatric cardiologist with training in advanced cardiac imaging, including MRI, co-principal investigator of the Aplerinone trial as well. Uh, we are also joined by Dr. Linda Kreip, who is Professor of Pediatrics at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, and who is the cardiologist with the Comprehensive Neuromuscular Team. Um, Linda will be starting this presentation, so go right ahead. All right. Well, thank you. I'd like to welcome everybody to um, the webinar today. And um, can we get the first slide up? All right. So. Uh, hopefully by the end of the hour we'll um, answer some of these questions um, that will hopefully be useful to you with regards to caring for your um, son's heart. The first one we'd like to um, talk about today will be what does the term cardiomyopathy mean? The second one would be what does heart failure mean? The third one is who should care for your child's heart? Uh, when should cardiac care begin? How will the heart be checked? what should I watch for, and what treatments are currently available. And finally, should carriers have their hearts checked as well. So what does the term cardiomyopathy mean? The picture in front of you demonstrates the normal heart. The blue blood comes back from the head and the feet and goes into the right receiving chamber known as the right atrium. The blood is then pumped into the right pumping chamber, also known as the right ventricle, and then pumped out into the lungs where it picks up oxygen. As you can see from the diagram here, it returns to the heart, oxygenated as, as shown in red, um, goes into the left atrium, then into the left ventricle, and then gets pumped out to the body. So cardiomyopathy is a disease of heart muscle, and as we saw, just the normal heart. And when the heart muscle is diseased, it um, doesn't work as well as it should, and it oftentimes becomes dilated. The process of um, injury to the heart includes um, muscle cell death. Uh, the chamber then enlarges. The walls of the heart become thin. Uh, scar tissue forms within the heart muscle. The scar tissue is known as fibrosis. And um, after there's a critical mass of fi fibrous tissue in the heart muscle, the function of the heart will then um, decline. And the next slide is coming up. Here is um, a pathologic specimen showing um, what we're talking about when we're talking about fibrosis forming within the heart muscle. As you can see, the blue arrow is pointing to these white areas within an autopsy specimen of the heart. And what we're looking at in these white areas is a fibrous tissue or scar in the, in the, um, the heart muscle. And then on the uh, pathology specimen um, next to that, you can see the blue areas um, which also demonstrates areas of scar. So as the process in Duchenne muscular dystrophy progresses, scar tissue forms in the heart muscle, which then eventually causes the heart to become dysfunctional. And that's what the term cardiomyopathy is referring to, the fact that the heart muscle is diseased. So what does heart failure mean? Well, heart failure is an incredibly complicated um, process and some of the uh, pathways associated in heart failure are shown on um, your right hand side there. But essentially it means that the heart fails to meet the demand, the needs of the body. It doesn't necessarily mean that the heart is failing, it just means that it's failing to meet the body's demands. Um, it occurs when cardiac function is poor, but can it also occur when you have good function and increased demands, in, such as uh, occurs in times of illness. Um, the body's uh, response at first um, to the process of the heart not working as well as it should is uh, helpful. The body tries to compensate, but eventually these compensatory um, mechanisms become uh, damaging to the body and to the heart. Um, and, but I think it is important to note that people can live very long and productive lives um, with heart failure. So the next important question is who should I have care for my son's heart? 
A cardiologist is, a, is an individual who takes care of hearts or is known as a heart doctor. Then there are pediatric cardiologists. Pediatric cardiologists, such as Dr. Horner and myself, are people who've trained in pediatrics as well as cardiology. Adult cardiologists have spent their time training in adult medicine and adult cardiology. So adult cardiologists are different than pediatric cardiologists. We both take care of the hearts, but in different populations of patients. Um, and then an important thing to note, to note is that some cardiologists have special interests, and these interests include heart failure and transplantation. Some cardiologists are interested in neuromuscular disorders, such as Dr. Hora and myself, um, and I think what you need to do is talk to your son's doctor, your primary care physician, about finding an expert um, in your area with regards to uh, treating heart failure. And since heart failure is a very, very common problem in the United States, there are lots of physicians who um, are trained in treating patients whose hearts are not working as well as they should. I think the most important thing to appreciate is that care of a, a young man with Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a team sport. And what that means is that I think it's important to involve all aspects of your son's care team um, in, their, uh, in caring for your child's heart. The lungs do not function without um, interacting with the heart. The skeletal muscle has an impact on the heart. Um, and your nutrition has an important impact on your heart. So all of, I, uh, as we, if we're taking care of the whole body, then we're also going to be taking care of the heart as well. Um, two uh, important consensus meetings were held back in the early 2000s to look at cardiovascular care in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, one of them was in Europe and the other one uh, was published in the United States um, in pediatrics. Um, these two documents sort of summarize uh, what at the time was thought to be current uh, standard uh, treatment algorithms for um, caring for a son with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and not much has changed since these have been published. The most recent thing, however, which I think is um, a large, uh, a summary of a large effort by the Center for Disease and Control was published in Lancet Neurology, and it was a two-part um, publication, and I would encourage you to get a copy of these if possible, because I think it's a very comprehensive and very well done document de describing not only uh, what current consensus is with regards to how the heart should be managed, but how all, all other aspects of Duchenne muscular dystrophy should be managed. Um, the diagram at the bottom of the slide, as you can see, is just a very, very small piece taken from um, that article that talks about uh, when uh, cardiac care should be initiated. Um, currently, we recommend that an echocardiogram or, or cardiac imaging is done at diagnosis or at least by the age of six years. This is essentially to establish a baseline. We don't expect to see problems with cardiac function at that early age. Um, then, after, until the age, after that period of time, we would recommend that the child's heart be evaluated at least once every uh, year or every two years until the age of 10. It's unusual to see um, uh, cardiac uh, dysfunction less than the age of 10, but not unheard of. So I think continued monitoring is important. And then once your child has reached the age of 10, we know that the, um, the incidence of uh, cardiac problems go up dramatically, and we um, recommend that um, the child be seen much more frequently, uh, possibly yearly, um, or every six months, and that will depend upon um, what's going on at the time and what the recommendations are from your child's physician. So what are some of the tests that we're going to be using to check your child's heart? Well, one of the things that we want to do is check to make sure that the heart rhythm is normal. Three tests that we commonly use to check for heart rhythm are the electrocardiogram. As you can see there in the picture, this is where the stickers are placed on the heart and an electrical picture is taken of what the heart is doing. This allows us to look for um, abnormalities of heart rate and rhythm. If the child is complaining of um, some symptoms, uh, for example, they say their heart, they feel the heart racing or they feel the heart skipping beats, two of the tests that might be used include a Holter monitor, which is um, shown on the other uh, cartoon there. It's uh, several EKG leads are placed on the chest and that is, they're connected to um, 
uh, small device that's worn by the child. This allows us to monitor every single heartbeat that uh, occurs over a 24 to 48 hour period of time. That monitor is then downloaded into computer and that rhythm can be um, can be printed out so that it can be analyzed extensively. An event monitor is very similar to a Holter monitor, but it's only used for a very brief periods of time to uh, try to capture or document um, events that might be cur occurring. So, if you're, for example, so if your child says once a week I'm having, um, I feel that my heart is racing, then you may take this monitor home and place it on your child's test when those symptoms occur. Whereas a Holter monitor is a 24-hour worn um, device, and if the symptoms don't occur during that period of time, then you've missed the opportunity to catch those things. So they're, they're used interchangeably, but which one is ordered depends on what's going on um, and what the clinical symptoms are at the time. Um, I don't, when looking at the electrocardiogram or the EKG, uh, we uh, evaluated this, and, and what we found was that the EKG is abnormal at a very early age. Even infants who are diagnosed prenatally because they have a family history ha oftentimes have abnormal EKGs um, in, in early infancy. Uh, we also found that early abnormalities were not predictive of what you were going uh, what your clinical course was going to be like. So if you have an abnormal EKG age 3, that does not necessarily mean that you are going to have heart failure or trouble as a result of your cardiomyopathy earlier than somebody whose EKG looks more normal at age 3. Um, the type of uh, abnormality does change with age, um, and it, this likely represents disease progression. And as we looked at earlier, we saw that as a fibrosis um, was present in the heart muscle, and so it's likely that as the fibrosis progresses or or, or becomes more extensive in the heart muscle, you're going to see disease um, progression on the electrocardiogram. One thing that we've noticed in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy is that the heart rate is often elevated, probably 10 to 15 beats per minute above normal. Um, however, a true accelerated heart rate usually only comes with uh, cardiac dysfunction. The most important thing is to watch for changes over time and to obtain a baseline um, at diagnosis. Uh, our institution, when I was recently at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, looked at this, um, the EKG abnormalities much more extensively. Um, next slide. Um, what we did was um, we looked at EKGs in uh, children less than um, 10 years of age, mainly because nobody had previously done looked at the younger boys' EKGs. Um, there was only one re previous report in the literature uh, done in a uh, cohort of boys less than six years of age, and they noticed an increase in EKG abnormalities of 26%. We took a look at uh, 78 steroid-naive boys less than six years of age, analyzed their EKGs, um, and noted their dystrophin mutations. We also looked to see if there was echocardiograms available for review within three months of when the EKGs were obtained. Um, there were 78 patients that were available for our study, and the average age of the boys that we looked at their EKGs at were around three and a half to four years, three and a half years of age. Um, what we found was that, just like I mentioned previously, 78% had one, at least one EKG abnormality, and um, we found that left ventricular hypertrophy on the electrocardiogram was the most prevalent abnormality, with right ventricular hypertrophy coming in as a close second. Other EKG abnormalities were rare, and only one patient had an abnormal echocardiogram um, associated with EKG abnormalities. The, um, we also looked to see if there was any correlation to where the dystrophin mutation occurred. Um, we noted, um, as is commonly known, that the most affected region was the central rod domain. However, we did not find an association between um, the affected dystrophin region and EKG abnormalities. Um, and obviously further work needs to be done to investigate the significance of these EKG changes. Uh, EKG abnormalities are clear, clearly present at an early age, um, and hopefully they can um, maybe possibly be used as uh, an outcome measure in future clinical trials. Uh, how will the heart be checked? Um, images of the heart will be attained to evaluate structure and function. And there are two common ways to obtain images of the heart. Um, the first being uh, 
by an echocardiogram, which is a cardiac ultrasound, and the second uh, one being uh, cardiac MRI, or um, as Dr. Hoare will discuss in, in, in a lot greater detail, um, cardiac imaging uh, by MRI. I don't know, Khan, if you want to take it over from here, or I'll, I'll just go to two more slides here. So um, the echocardiogram obviously is an ultrasound evaluation of the heart. It allows us to evaluate the heart's um, contraction and relaxation. The advantages are that it's uh, readily available and very quick. Um, and disadvantages, however, and they're important disadvantages, include that the image quality is extremely unreliable. Um, the, these young men suffer from scoliosis and altered chest uh, dimensions, which makes imaging difficult. Also, um, if the a young man is overweight, that can also affect cardiac imaging, and it's very difficult to position the young boys on the table appropriately. It's also not um, accurate for right ventricular function. Linda, there's a question about the last two images of the heart. Um, which one was the one that was affected with heart damage? Uh, the 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 entire myocardium, both the right and left ventricle, are affected in um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But most most concerning, however, is um, dysfunction of the left ventricle or the left sided pumping chamber. On the next slide, we see um, we're, is the introduction to uh, the section where we're going to talk about cardiac MRI imaging, which is, I think, an exciting um, uh, way to image the heart, and it has really um, allowed us to see things that we hadn't uh, ever seen before and to think about the disease in new and important ways. Um, cardiac MRI offers some advantages in that there's no radiation exposure. Um, it allows us to uh, have detailed cardiac information, it allows us to make accurate volume and mass measurements, and in addition, it allows us to look at that heart muscle scarring that we were talking about earlier. Disadvantages is that, is that it allows, it requires an IV to be placed. It can be um, a longer test. Um, young men can get claustrophobic, obviously, not only young men with Duchenne, but anyone can get claustrophobic in an MRI machine. Um, the test can be expensive. Um, and in very young children who are uncooperative would require uh, sedation. So at this point, I will let Dr. Hoare take over. Uh, good day, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to um, present uh, our work today uh, in conjunction with uh, Dr. Kripe. Uh, so I kind of want to briefly, before I go into more details about uh, cardiac MRI, kind of take a look at what is the advantage of uh, cardiac MRI we'll call CMR over ECHO. Or as Linda said, really it, has, it does give you really accurate detailed information on the anatomy, the heart function using ejection fraction, chamber size, some of the echo, but really what's important is that it can actually go beyond that into potentially assessing the metabolism of the heart, uh, evidence of scar tissue, how much of it would, it's located in, also looking at blood flow, uh, perfusion to the heart, as well as really what we're focusing on is the myocardial strain or circumferential strain. So, you know, ECHO is a great tool to use when kids are young, uh, uh, particularly when they don't need sedation. So when should the cardiac MRI be performed? You know, typically uh, not before age six or seven. This is typically uh, when uh, you would no longer need sedation in the majority of patients. And who should be performing, who should be involved in performing a cardiac MRI? So a, typically a cardiologist uh, who um, works with the clinical cardiologist, uh, such as myself, uh, working in conjunction with Dr. Kreit, is, that should be involved. In some places, there are radiologists who are also involved. Um, and how often should uh, cardiac MRI be performed? Uh, so at this stage, you know, as we are getting to understand the disease process better, uh, I believe that uh, you know, patients should get at least a yearly uh, uh, cardiac imaging, um, you know, if not MRI alternating with uh, um, echocardiogram. But I think as the patients get older, I think yearly uh, cardiac MRI is an important tool to use, and I'll show you later why that's important. And does my son need an intravenous catheter? So, uh, yes, you know, our goal is to get uh, the uh, intravenous catheter in, typically because we're giving a medication called gadolinium. This allows us to look at the, the amount of scar, the, the presence of scar in, in uh, your son or anyone else that we're looking at. How long will the study take? Uh, you know, t it typically can be as, as quick as 45 minutes to as long as 60 minutes. Again, depending on how uh, well you sit still in the scanner, if you're able to breath hold well, you know, it, it can go faster. But as, as everyone knows um, in our boys with uh, Duchenne, you know, some of boys don't have the ability to hold their breath that long, so therefore it does take a little longer sometimes. 
So what happens if you or your son is claustrophobic? Uh, you can be prescribed some Valium to help you relax. Typically, that has served very well for most uh, most patients. So as this is uh, the images are pulling up. So on on the top panel here, you'll see that an echocardiogram here on the top panel is of a young uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy patient. And the images are very beautiful. The heart function looks very normal. The chamber size looks normal. And that's great. Uh, but unfortunately, as um, the boys get older, due to multiple causes uh, uh, from you know, scoliosis to other things, uh, just like anyone else, as you, as you get bigger, it's much harder for the ultrasound to penetrate uh, your chest wall to look at the heart. And, and this, you can have images that are not very that uh, great. And it makes it very difficult to make a good diagnosis, really particularly in a case where you really need uh, good images uh, to tell you exactly what's going on uh, with the boys in order to really decide how well they're doing and whether they need more treatment or whether the treatment is uh, effective for them or not. So uh, I, hopefully that everyone can see this. So this is a, a cardiac MRI of a young, uh, of a young uh, boy with DMD. And you can see that the images are very pretty and the heart uh, function looks completely normal. Uh, and then the next slide I'm going to show you a, a, boy, a DMD patient that's older and you can see the images are equally uh, um, nice, uh, but um, the, unfortunately for this patient at the older age, his heart is no longer functioning normally um, with a very low ejection fraction. So when we're talking about cardiac MRI, traditionally ejection fraction is a really good tool to use. It really assesses globally how, uh, uh, how well the heart, uh, cardiac is functioning, so how well it squeezes. And it's currently the gold standard tool for assessing heart function uh, in monitoring disease, as well as in, is in at looking at treatment efficacy. Unfortunately, EF decline is really a late uh, finding, particularly in uh, DMD boys, really, really when the heart no longer squeezes normally. So what we really want to know is, are there ways to look at DMD-associated heart disease beyond squeezing to allow us to really uh, find out what's going on earlier? Um, so... There are multiple uh, things that you can look at. I'm going to really concentrate on two main things here. The first one is really looking at the myocardial tissue characteristic, which is a late gadolinium enhancement, uh, which is actually is a way to look at uh, myocardial fibrosis or scar in the heart. The second one is looking at the uh, left ventricle mechanics, which is really using a, a, a technique called myocardial tagging, uh, and we can actually look at myocardial strain. And I'll explain that in a little bit of detail in, uh, in a couple slides there. So myocardial tissue characteristics. So looking at myocardial fibrosis or scar imaging, it's a way for us to directly image the heart to detect how much scar there is after using uh, the IV placement and giving a medication called, called gadolinium. Uh, this does not expose your son to radiation at all. It's just something that lasts for about 15, 20 minutes and it goes away. Uh, so, and this has been validated against uh, other types of scan, including PET scan as well as uh, uh, pathologic slides. So late gadolinium late enhancement, or LGE, really demonstrates non-viable or scar tissue and bright er, uh, as bright areas, and normal tissue as dark areas, as, as I will show you in the uh, next slide here. So you can see here, um, in the uh, top slide is a uh, uh, boy with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. You can see that the scar formation actually is actually more on the outside surface of the heart, the epicardial surface here, uh, and then in a patient who has a heart attack, for example, like ischemic uh, uh, cardiomyopathy, actually it's on the inside. So that's one of the unique findings in uh, boys with DMD, as well as factors that the scar formation starts actually is on the outside. So here we're looking at, uh, I think you saw the slide on the uh, right before that Linda showed earlier. This is just the, uh, an image, for, a sample image from a patient here, showing the white areas being scar. As I said earlier, the darker area is normal tissue, and that this correlates in the, that on the outside, in this pathologic slide here, all this white area is where it's scar, and then on the inside, the uh, heart tissue is actually normal, at least on, on this particular slide. And again, in the pathologic slide, the blue area is what we're staining uh, different types of tissue that are in indicators of, of uh, scar tissue or fibrosis. You know, so uh, there have been several papers that were done, including uh, from, our, uh, from our group here, and really, what we're showing was uh, in this paper that there was uh, fibrosis or heart uh, scar was associated with heart dysfunction. But what we noticed was there was actually a couple patients that really uh, did not have uh, abnormal function but yet had some scar. So really this brought up, you know, is that is 
in myocardial fibrosis, is this a precursor to global uh, uh, myocardial dysfunction, i.e. Uh, abnormal ejection fraction. So you can see here a patient who is really kind of towards the end stage where the scar burden really is pretty much at the low, whole left heart, but you can see that it really is on all the free wall and we're, uh, spares the septum here across the whole three levels of the heart here. Now on the other hand, you can see a, uh, a younger patient who although has tremendous amount, a great amount of scar, uh, actually his heart function is completely normal. So I think this was giving us some hint that maybe the myocardial fibrosis or um, well, scar is actually um, can show up early, and as Linda alluded to earlier, you probably have to have a certain amount of tissue that's damaged that can uh, that eventually leads to the global heart dysfunction with uh, the in injection fraction. So this is a pretty large series of, of study looking at about 240 plus uh, patients here. You can see that on the uh, top three panels here, I'm going to concentrate on this red box here. These are LG positive patients actually have scars. So. If your son is actually less than 10 years old, 13% of the boys actually had some scar. And as you age a little bit older, between 10 to 15 years of age, you actually about a quarter of the boys actually have scar. Now, once you're above age 15, uh, more than half the boys have scar, whether the ejection fraction is abnormal or not. Now, if you take age away and just look at just ejection fraction uh, alone, you can see that about a quarter of the boys actually have abnormal uh, scar formation despite a normal ejection fraction uh, of greater than 55%. Now, when the boys develop ejection fraction abnormality, i.e. global dysfunction, virtually uh, almost 100%, uh, 85% plus of the boys actually have scar formation. So this part is not very surprising here, but I think what's really the most important is actually the boys who actually have normal ejection fraction and then the boys that are really young actually have scar uh, way before the presence of abnormal heart dysfunction. Uh, heart function, dysfunction. So I think this is a, taking all the boys here, you can see that the red are patients who don't have scar. And the blue dots are patients who have scars. So if you look at, I divide this in several quadrants here. You can see that that most of the boys that are, uh, have normal uh, heart function, lot, most of them actually don't have scar, but a fair number of them does. And then in the same spectrum, a lot of the boys who have uh, abnormal heart function with EF less than 55% actually have scar. And same as age, uh, younger age, uh, some have scar. And then older age, most patients who are pretty much beyond 15, a good number of patients actually have scar formation already. So if you kind of take a look at summary, this is a really large series, really trying to describe what we call the prevalence of LG or scar formation in DMD patients. So not very uh, surprisingly that LG is strongly associated with abnormal heart function by, decline, by abnormal EF, but uh, at least a quarter percent, 15% uh, of patients have an LGE despite normal EF. LG is really short associated with older age, but about 13% of the boys actually have LGE formation even though they're less than 10 years of age. So I think LGE or scar um, uh, uh, marker is, is, uh, scar detection is really a good marker to detect for fibrosis and really may actually precede uh, heart dysfunction uh, as assessed by uh, ejection fraction. So, uh, you know, I think my belief is that uh, cardiac MRI uh, with LG assessment should be performed yearly in DMD patients uh, starting as early as age 10, uh, 10 years, and I would uh, recommend this to be done yearly. So if you take a look at the summary here, um, you know, uh, is that late Gatlin enhancement uh, for myocardial fibrosis is associated with age and abnormal EF, but it's still prevalent or common even in young patients with, abnormal, with normal EF, and LG is a useful marker and may precede abnormal EF, and it should be performed in all DMD patients, uh, especially if, you, uh, if the boys are going through a cardiac MRI scan anyway. Uh, the, place, the, the placement of an IV with the use of gadolinium is, is quite useful. So in conjunction with looking at SCAR, you know, we want to really want to know, is there a more sensitive method beyond squeeze that we can use to detect the cardiac dysfunction earlier? So, uh, you know, I, we've been working on looking at left ventricular mechanics, mostly looking at myocardial tagging for myocardial strain. And the goal is to, to see if we can define this to be a more sensitive mean of assessing myocardial contractility uh, beyond squeeze. So. The limitations with ejection fraction, as I said, is a great tool, but it's really insensitive when you have alterations in regional performance. You know, areas that have some, some scar, although your, your global EF may be uh, normal, it really conceals that and really un, uh, underestimate actually uh, how um, far advanced a patient's disease is. And because EF lacks the intrinsic ability to uh, detect a myocardial um, uh, marker, it means that the heart contraction really cannot be measured by traditional techniques such as ejection fraction. 
So hopefully one of the uh, images are playing. Essentially, ejection fraction measures global state of how well the HUD squeezes. And really what we're looking for is a more sensitive method beyond squeeze that can detect cardiac dysfunction. So I'm going to take a couple uh, seconds here to really uh, give you a little bit of sense here. So kind of give you a sense of what the concept of strain, uh, strain is. So what you can see is, uh, although it's a still image, this is a tag imaging that we do. In this case, this box here represents the small area of interest here. And you can see as the rectangular box moves from the screen left to the screen right, that's called displacement, meaning how the heart moving. And velocity is also uh, how fast the heart moves. Uh, so this is really just motion. Now, what it doesn't, you know, what we want to know is strain. So strain is measurement of cardiac deformation. So what is the tissue actually doing? And it really allows direct access of uh, the degree of regional mild cardio deformation. So relative uh, positive strain is stretching and negative strain is uh, contracting. So there are many, many different ways of looking at strain, but what we're really concentrating is uh, circumferential strain is really looking at how well the tissue is actually uh, shortening. So based on this tool, we were able to show that we can detect circumferential strain abnormalities early in young DMD patients. And further decline in strain magnitude was seen with just age despite normal global uh, heart function by ejection fraction. And uh, reduced EF resulted in further decline in, uh, in strain magnitude. And when you have scar formation along with further decline in ejection fraction, you uh, have further reduction in strain magnitude. So the question is, is this reproducible over time? So we took a look at a, a fairly small number of patients, about 50 boys, uh, approximately 16 months apart, and you can see that um, strain magnitude gets lower on all patients over the study period, whereas in patients uh, looking at ejection fraction, some patients actually went up and some patients went down, despite really no medication uh, changes. Uh, so. In essence, EF is really uh, not a uh, great tool in this case because it's much more variable and less sensitive than myocardial strain. So if you put myocardial strain and scar formation together, what we want to know is does circumferential strain predict myocardial scar uh, formation in DMD-associated cardiac disease? What, we wanna hypo what we're looking for is, is hypothesizing that strain predicts the development of scar uh, in the early stage of DMD-associated cardiac disease, really prior to development of abnormal heart function as assessed by ejection fraction. So we have a, a fairly small study in that right now, but um, 39 patients really who have uh, two studies of approximately 12 months apart. So all patients have no scar in the first study, and then, uh, and then so that's 16 patients, and then um, about 23 patients have developed scar on the second study, and the studies were approximately 12 months apart. So what we found was that the strain magnitude was actually low in patients who would eventually develop scar. And we believe that strain, uh, um, although may not be able to predict scar formation uh, uh, directly, uh, but that in conjunction um, with ejection, uh, with um, uh, scar formation actually is able to potentially predict development of uh, uh, ejection fraction decline. And that the combination of strain and myocardial scar uh, may serve as a sensitive uh, marker for assessing outcome of future clinical trials, uh, which I, I will uh, touch base in a little bit. I'm going to turn the uh, slide back to Linda so she can detail some of the other um, aspect of the monitoring of patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. All right. So um, now that we've talked about cardiac imaging uh, and how your physician is going to evaluate the, your child's heart, what types of things should you watch for um, at home. I think it's important to understand, and, and you hear about this all the time in the press, and you hear about this on the radio and the television, know what is normal for your son, know what is normal for you. Um, learn, uh, one thing you might do is learn to take his pulse at rest when he's happy, when he's uh, doing his daily activities, um, while he's busy, while right after he's made a transfer, when he's putting a lot of effort forth. Um, and also why he's sleeping. Um, and also to buy a stethoscope. You know, you can get him now for $10, $15, maybe even a little bit more at your local drugstore because it does. Uh, it's sometimes easier to count a pulse or to count a heart rate from a stethoscope than it is to, um, to take a pulse from um, a wrist um, sometimes. Um, and I think the most important thing is to develop a relationship with your care team before or your care provider before you need them. The, the worst thing you want to do is meet somebody in a crisis situation. Um, 
heart failure symptoms are often difficult um, to identify in a, in a Duchenne patient um, because they're not ambulatory in many instances. And, and so one of the ways in heart failure um, we talk about um, whether you're symptomatic is how far can you ambulate. And, and in this instance, that wouldn't be pertinent. So things such as rapid weight gain or loss are important, swelling of the feet or overall puffiness. Now, I'm going to say that, and, and swelling of the feet is a real common thing to see in patients who have their feet hanging um, at the edge of a wheelchair all day long. So you get a lot of swelling of the feet from dependent edema. Um, or to just just from having your feet hang down, and that wouldn't be heart failure. So all of these things have to go together to create a picture that is concerning. Um, whether the heart is racing or skipping beats, or if you have fainting, also known as syncope, that's important. Chest pain is extremely common, and it's usually musculoskeletal. However, it can sig signify coronary occlusion or myocarditis in extremely rare cases. So if, you, if your child is having chest pain, not just, oh, my gosh, my chest hurts a little bit, but really knock down, drag out, crying, chest pain, that might be worth um, contacting your physician immediately about. Um, and, and in those instances, we can always check cardiac enzymes or consider additional imaging. So what treatments are available? I mean, I think I'll just briefly review this because this is a topic that's going to be um, talked about in future webinars, but currently just standard heart failure treatment. There is nothing unique to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, it's taken from the adult heart failure experience. There is, um, uh, and the goal is to improve survival, uh, slow disease progression, and to help alleviate symptoms. Um, some of the drugs that are commonly used are drugs that we use to treat heart failure in any individual, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers such as Lasartan, beta blockers, um, diuretics, uh, drugs that uh, help pull extra uh, fluid off the body when the body isn't um, the heart isn't working as well as it should, aldosterone receptor antagonists such as spironolactone, which Dr. Hoare will be talking about very shortly because there's an ongoing clinical trial. And uh, if the heart really isn't working very well, the blood can pool inside the heart, and um, it's important to reduce your clot risk uh, by uh, using Coumadin or aspirin. Uh, big question, do steroids benefit the heart? I think this is a topic for uh, its own private webinar, but, um, I, you know, I think that we definitely feel that steroids are a benefit to treat the um, skeletal muscle in, in muscular dystrophy, um, and it, there may be some benefit um, for cardiac muscle as well. There's definitely some literature to support that. However, this is a big black um, box type of question in that uh, no clinical trial has ever really looked at steroid dosing, steroid use, age of onset, and um, how how well the heart is going to perform long term. So, you know, I think when you're asking uh, what treatments are available, it's always going to be an individualized risk, risk benefit analysis. You know, I think um, uh, if there is abnormal function, the benefits from heart failure treatment are well established. Um, in normal function, um, in, in young kids, I, I, I think it's really unclear. You know, um, should you put your child on a medication? Should you start it at age three? Should you put that child at risk for that medication um, over years and years and years? I think that these are questions that we don't have good answers to. I think it's unlikely that we'll ever have good answers to. So I think that this is a discussion that you need to have with your physician and um, just make the best decision for um, you and, and your son. Um, obviously, the risks are associated with the side effects of drugs, and uh, many of these drugs have not uh, shown to have clear benefit in patients with muscular dystrophy. So just to briefly, briefly touch on a couple of other treatments, um, pacemakers, um, cardiac resynchronization therapy is very trendy now in heart failure management, and what that essentially does is it says that when the heart isn't working well, it loses its normal um, sort of cardiac dance, the way the heart squeezes, is a, as we saw from some of the earlier slides of really um, nicely done slides with cardiac motion, there's a normal cardiac motion, and when, when the heart is sick and when the heart gets a lot of scar, that normal motion is lost. And so if we used a pacemaker to try to reestablish that normal dance of the heart, would we be able to improve how well it is working? Um, that and, and in the adults, they found that 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 is somewhat true, that if you restore that normal dance, that, that may help patients with heart failure. Now, one thing that we did was we looked um, with, uh, and Dr. Hoare was part of this, we, a big part of this, we um, looked at um, whether you could 
find evidence of dysynchrony um, in, in this patient population, and I think what we found was that there was cardiac chaos. And so I, I think that we didn't proceed um, to move forward with regards to using pacemakers in this patient population because we felt that they would not be of benefit. Um, this is also something that is beyond the scope of this webinar, but I just want to mention it. Uh, ventricular assist devices are being now used in end-stage um, patients with heart failure as a bridge to transplantation or as what we call destination therapy as a, as a final treatment. And it's very cutting-edge technology, uh, has a possible benefit for uh, some patients with Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy, um, but I think that the, um, the, we're still exploring this, we're at this the very beginning, or we're just coming up to the starting line with regards to looking at the therapy uh, for, the use, uh, for use in patients with muscular dystrophy as well as children. Uh, and also cardiac transplantation. Uh, very few du uh, Duchenne patients have been transplanted. Uh, however, more Becker patients have been transplanted. Obviously, problems were related to donor availability, and then you're just trading one disease for another. Uh, and then all the chronic um, medications and lifestyle issues associated with having a heart transplant are important as well. So, so not, not a walk in the park, as they would say. And should carriers have their hearts checked? Often cardiac disease is the only manifestation of the, uh, being a carrier, and the cardiomyopathy definitely, uh, risk definitely increases with age. Um, there was a study done uh, several years ago where it looked at 350 uh, Duchenne and Becker carrier moms. Um, all people in less than the age of 16 were normal, and the incidence definitely rose up to 16% um, in individuals over 50 years of age. Now, if you look at the literature, the incidence of who's at risk and, and how much risk they are at is tremendously variable. Some studies would say 25%, and you can find some studies that will say up to 75% of carrier moms are at risk. So I think um, we really haven't explored that issue uh, as well as we should. Um, and what, But the current recommendations are essentially those for the for the boys, a baseline evaluation should be undertaken as a young adult. Um, and, and every three to five years, um, uh, have it looked at again. Be aware of symptoms. Um, and I think that an important thing is to just take care of yourself, minimize other cardiovascular risk factors such as smoking, hypertension, or cholesterol. And, um, you know, I think that this slide just reiterates um, uh, things that Dr. Hoare already said in that you can see the pattern of fibrosis and scar tissue development in, patient, in carrier uh, females in the same distribution that you can see them in the boys with muscular dystrophy. Um, who should buy, provide cardiac care to the carriers? Cardiologists with experience in heart failure, transplantation, and or other neuromuscular disorders. Uh, many individuals may not be familiar with the diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy or the risk that you are at. So I think it's important to um, try to associate yourself with um, cardiologists who, who have that expertise, and, and I think you can locate those individuals um, with the help of your son's cardiologist, hopefully. Um, and a carrier mom should have the same testing as the patient with Duchenne, um, such as an EKG, Holter event monitors, cardiac MRIs, and echocardiograms. And, and treatments will be the same for um, for you as they would be for your son. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Um, so I'm going to just uh, summarize a little bit of some of the current cardiac clinical trials uh, with really just some comments on the first two and then a little bit more detail about the uh, the last one. Um, so as most of uh, you may be aware that are not many uh, cardiac clinical trials as most of the past research and trials have really f uh, concentrated on, uh, on muscle um, issues as well as pulmonary function issues, you know, but um, I'm just going to comment. The first study is Revatio, aka Sedenafil, or Viagra. It's really thought to, uh, the study was performed to determine if this drug is safe and it can it improve heart function in patients with DMD or BMD. Uh, the next study is called Tadalafil uh, and Sedanafil, which are just uh, the same thing but slightly different analogs, and it determined if either of these drugs can improve heart muscle function blood flow during exercise in DMD patients. So that's about all I'm going to comment on that as I'm not involved with either one of those studies. Uh, so the next study is, is the Aplerinol aldosterone antagonist trial. So why is this important? So it just give you a, a brief summary. Um, so it just stems from really three different components, uh, how we are doing the study today. The first is really, you know, our clinical experience that over the last, uh, you know, seven to, eight, seven to eight years, 
Uh, we have really uh, found that many of the boys uh, continue to progress uh, with scar formation despite the standard current treatment. Uh, and we noticed that they, a lot of these boys actually have scar formation really before the presence of abnormal uh, heart function as I shown earlier. Uh, uh, and we noticed that the strain was uh, abnormal early and continued to be abnormal uh, with, uh, with age and disease progression. So that's really one big component was the clinical ability to detect uh, disease uh, in two different ways. The second is, is our um, uh, uh, collaborator, Dr. Subaraman in OSU, who looked at uh, D DMD equivalent mice when they were treated with um, the uh, aldosterone antagonists. Um, these uh, mice actually seemed to do better uh, later on in uh, later on in their life, uh, which which also tells you that maybe there is some efficacy. Of this, uh, you know, um, and the third component is that in the adult uh, uh, population, adult trials. Adult patients who had a heart attack who were treated with a, uh, a aldosterone antagonist, whether it's a plerinone, uh, aldactone, or spironolactone, they're pretty much the same type of drug with slight variability. Uh, what happened was that these adults actually had less scar uh, formation. So the question that we have is really to determine if a plerinone or aldosterone antagonist is able to slow down the process of scar formation in the heart. So why are we doing this research? So as, as you're all aware, DMD patients have an absolute genetic risk of developing DMD-associated heart disease with scar formation and eventual uh, heart dysfunction. Uh, when the heart starts to scar, we, don't really, we do not know how fast this will happen or how slow the course will happen. Um, at present, you know, we use drugs to support the heart function. As Linda said, they're not very dystrophin specific and they stem from adult heart failure uh, treatment strategies. And we don't know if this is the same for DMD patients. And really, there is no current treatment to prevent or decrease scar formation. So a plerinone is a drug that might slow down the process of scar formation in the heart. We don't know if this is true or not. This is why we're doing a trial um, and to see if this is effective. So, you know, who's running this study and who's involved in this study? So this is a really a collaboration between multiple institutions, I think, uh, which is quite important uh, in this case, you know, with Cincinnati uh, Children's Hospital, Ohio State, uh, nationwide Children's Hospital, as well as uh, um, partners from the Christ Hospital. Now, who's funding the study? The major funding is actually from uh, Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy with uh, Blue Sky, as well as the Leonard uh, Center for Research and Education at the Christ Hospital Foundation. Uh, and who are the investigators for this study? So uh, listed below, I won't name the names here, uh, the investigators who are involved with the study, uh, who really have a combined experience, really uh, pretty tremendous, and, and most of these people uh, have uh, have association with working in Ohio, we'd have to say, um, at one point or another. So, as I said earlier, uh, what is the purpose of the study? So, it is to determine if a plerinone can slow down heart muscle damage in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And who's el eligible for this study? So, you may be eligible in this study if you're able, if you're a male DMD patient who is at least seven years of age, and that's important mostly because of the use of sedation. You do not have any kidney failure, as most cardiac medications can affect the kidney, uh, including a plerinone. Uh, and you're, not, you're currently not taking a plerinone or a drug that is similar to a plerinone, such as aldactone or spironolactone. And you're able to undergo a cardiac MRI uh, scan without sedation. We don't want to give the risk of sedation as a, uh, as a, as a, um, a negative impact on the study. And then one of the important things that we, in order for everyone to be on the same line, that most patients are, are either already on an ACE inhibitor or, or out or will be put on one. And you have to have a baseline cardiac MRI. Unfortunately, in this case, it has to be either done, uh, it has to be done in uh, one of our institutions here. You have to have some scar tissue, um, uh, and, but yet have normal ejection fraction. And just due to limitation support, uh, uh, for this pilot study, we're just looking for specific uh, um, abilities, so uh, speaking English only at this stage. Um, so where will the study take place? So the two main places that's being done is at Cincinnati Children's Hospital where the studies are done, uh, along with Ohio State. Uh, so you have to have a baseline uh, study um, at either location, um, doing your either coming in as part of the study or the clinical visit. Um, and then during your one, three, and nine-month visits, uh, you actually can get laboratory studies locally. This really is looking at the potassium as well as uh, your kidney uh, 
uh, function uh, just because uh, the combination of different drugs can Im impact on your potassium level as, you, as, you, uh, as well as your kidney function, and we want to make sure that the boys are safe. And then during the six months and 12 months visit, you come to the original site, the, the initial site that you were at, to obtain um, uh, your cardiac, repeat cardiac MRI as well as to obtain some blood draw to look for safety as well as evidence of scar tissue uh, uh, by blood serology. So are we still actively recruiting? We are uh, halfway. We are at a halfway mark, uh, and um, you know I think due to tr the tremendous interest from uh, PPMD as well as the family uh, who are interested in, in contributing to this, we are uh, uh, at a really a, a, a rate uh, at a point where we're where we are hoping to be. So where can you learn more about the study? Um, so you can contact us below, or, or you can look at the um, clinicaltrials.org. Uh, so I'm going to turn this table back to Linda to complete the conclusion of this uh, webinar. All right. So um, in conclusion, um, cardiac evaluation should begin at diagnosis. Um, ongoing cardiac follow-up is important and the best way to ensure long-term um, cardiac health. Uh, when there is evidence of abnormal cardiac function, um, treatment is definitely recommended, and unfortunately all we have at the moment is current heart failure uh, tools, but um, those are good tools. And early treatment prior to the onset of dysfunction is unproven and controversial. Um, it's not to say that it shouldn't be done. However, it's important to consider the risks and benefits of the treatments that you're considering. and maintain an open dialogue with all your care providers um, and to uh, make sure that they are working for you. And finally, uh, and most importantly, you and your family are uh, the most important uh, members of the healthcare team. Um, so it's important to take care of yourself so you can take care of your sons and, um, and make sure that um, you are at a place um, where they are communicating with you, maintaining an open dialogue and making sure that you're getting uh, state-of-the-art and contemporary treatments. So I think that concludes our, um, our presentation. Thank you so much. That was a lot of information for 50 minutes. And there are, are several questions. A couple of them have to do with carrier uh, moms. First of all, who's best to care for the carrier mom? Linda, do you can you answer that maybe? Yeah, I mean I think that you know you you want to choose a cardiologist, obviously somebody who has experience um with the heart, and I, I think that it would be nice to have a cardiologist who is knowledgeable in, in what your actual risk is. Uh, we would recommend that you have an adult cardiologist with some heart failure treat, uh, background, maybe, or some experience in cardiomyopathy, to be sure. Here at um, Nationwide Children's, we actually have a carrier mom's clinic, and that is staffed by uh, one of our uh, adult um, uh physicians who has expertise in heart failure and experience in cardiomyopathy. Okay. And is there an association between the carrier risk of cardiomyopathy and specific mutations? I don't think we know that yet. I would agree. Likewise. Okay. Um, uh, defects, there was a question about whether de cardiac defects such as mitral valve prolapse are more common in carriers, but I think we all agree that it's just as common in, um, as in the general public. That's correct, um, okay. Kathy. We looked at uh, in about 350 boys over um, close to 800 plus studies. Uh, I've, we've not really seen any, so I, I think it is, as you said, uh, not any different than the general population. Okay, Con. There's a couple of questions about MRI after sure. spinal fusion. Is MRI still possible? Yes, uh, spinal fusion is is not a contraindication. Uh, the material that is used does not provide does not cause any harm. Uh, to the patients at all, um, and, you know, sometimes it can kind of uh, blur the images uh, due to some artifacts uh, if you use a higher field strength. So typically uh, when, you know, your physician orders a cardiac MRI and is note that uh, your, patient, your, your son has a spinal fusion uh, done, we will try to put it on a, a slightly different scanner with a, a low field strength. But I, in either field strength, it's actually safe, so it's not a safety issue. We've gotten uh, nice, very nice images uh, on, on the boys with spinal fusion uh, rods. Okay, and um, scar formation seen at an early age uh, correlates with, oh, what did I say? Um, the, so the question is whether the car, scar formation correlates with um, cardiac dysfunction. 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think, you know, um, you know, to be honest, I think we're pretty much in the early phase. You know, I think the really aggressive assessment of how it, how it uh, function really using uh, studies beyond just your EF and your shortening fraction, i.e. traditional uh, parameters of how it function, how the heart squeeze is fairly new. And, and I think as we, the more we do it, we're, we're trying to get a sense. I think, you know, uh, what we what we notice is probably if you have a small amount of scar, um, you don't have much uh, dysfunction. But I think as Linda alluded to earlier, you know, the more scar you have, you know, it kind of gets more into more parts of the heart, but actually uh, more thickness of the heart. I think when you have a certain amount of scar uh, development, uh, it, you eventually lead to heart dysfunction. Uh, you know, I think that's what really what we're trying to define. We want to be able to prove that is true, true, and real. Uh, you know, I think there's some really great data out there that, that does support, uh, you know, that, that scar can happen before heart dysfunction, and it can be an early indicator of heart dysfunction. Okay, and I, I, I'm not sure um, how if you can answer this, but sure. do you think that most cardiologists caring for the Duchenne population are aware that cardiac MRIs with uh, delayed enhancement should be um, uh, I can answer that uh, question in some way. I think, you know, um, I, I think it eventually will, uh, but I think um, what our experience is with the uh, um, early part of the um, uh, this clinical trial here is that many of our patients uh, from across the country as well as around the world, you know, uh, echo is still a very, very common uh, method of assessing function. And in many patients, uh, when even when they get cardiac MRI, uh, they don't look at, um, you know, fibrosis. I think if you're a young boy that's less than seven years of age, it's unlikely you have any scar tissue, so it's not truly that beneficial. But, you know, if you remember, 13% of the boys who are between uh, are age less than 10 really have some scar formation. So I think, uh, I think you know, um, the uh, idea that, um, uh, that cardiac MRI with, with uh, um, uh, fibrosis imaging, I don't think it is, it is as... Uh, um, common knowledge as we would hope it would be, but hopefully after this webinar, um, you know, this would be more, uh, uh, this would be, um, this information would be better disseminated. And part of it is that most institution, you know, unless you have uh, the specialist who is able to do that and, um, and the machinery and the, and the software to look at this, you just don't have the capabilities to do that as MRI machines are quite expensive. Okay, and, and gadolinium enhancement um, is tagged, and that's what's used to measure the strain, correct? Oh, nope. Uh, so let me correct. Let me uh, clear that a little bit. So uh, cardiac tag imaging is that's just a special sequence that we use uh, that allows us to look at myocardial mechanics. So that's that's kind of a equivalent, but a better way of looking heart function. Gadolinium is a way for what happens when you have gadolinium that gets into the heart. Uh, um, any tissue that is abnormal, the gadolinium is not able to escape, and therefore it remains bright and white. So okay. gadolinium looks at, uh, allows us to look at scar tissue. Okay, much much clearer. Linda, can you, just as we wrap up, speak just a little bit about the carrier clinic at um, Nationwide? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I saw the question online. I think that, you know, hopefully that this type of care is available anywhere in the United States. I think that you know, what's nice if, if you tie a carrier clinic into um, the Duchenne clinic uh, that your boys are being seen in is that you can sort of do one-stop shopping. However, um, and and that the cardiologist taking care of you will also be knowledgeable in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But that can happen at any place around the country. And, and, and adult heart failure um, people are, are everywhere because adult heart failure is a, is a huge problem in this country, as you know, because of, of – uh, the fact that as we age, we, we have significant heart disease. So I think that, um, uh, you know, I think just to make sure that your cardiologist is aware of why you are there. I, you know, my experience with some of the families, some of the moms, is that, you know, they, they'll say, well, I went to my cardiologist and, and he or she kind of looked at me like, what are you doing here? And and I think that if that's the response you're getting, then then you're not getting the response you need to. I mean, I think then you need to say, I'm here because I'm at risk because I'm a carrier of a muscle disease that could affect my heart and I may be at risk for cardiomyopathy. And so I think if you, if you, if, if you find that type of person, I think that that type of care exists everywhere. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to thank you both very much. This has been really informative. And, again, this will be archived online, so this will be able to be viewed at any time. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Kripe as well as Dr. Hoare for participating and um, thank everyone for listening as well. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.
All right, this ends our uh, first webinar on cardiomyopathy, and um, 